Hey everyone, welcome to Neuropod, a channel about all things related to the Elon Musk company Neuralink. My name is Ryan Tanaka, and here's the outline for this update episode. First, are you wondering when Neuralink implants will be available for healthy humans? Fortunately, Siobhan Zillis, one of the main project directors at Neuralink, spoke at a Canadian conference on artificial intelligence and answered a bunch of questions. We'll share highlights of that talk. And then next, we'll discuss a company called Kernel. This is a company that Elon Musk was considering joining before deciding to start Neuralink. Then we have some great questions from an IEEE Spectrum interview with a Neuralink team leader. This talk with Siobhan Zillis is from earlier this year, but it's one of the most recent public conversations about Neuralink from an actual Neuralink employee. After going to Yale, Siobhan focused on artificial intelligence. She's worked on various AI projects at Tesla and is currently on the board of OpenAI. She also plays a big role in making progress at Neuralink. In this first clip, she comments on how her Neuralink work compares to other projects she's worked on. The thing I'm going to talk to you guys about today is Neuralink, which has been like kind of the most fascinating thing I've, and complicated, but like also fascinating thing I've ever encountered in my life, um, which does fold into AI, uh, you, you know, AI unfolding in the best possible way in the world but more from an existential perspective. So, you know, back when I was at Bloomberg Beta, I was really focusing on like applications for good. And as I thought about it more and more, I was like, well, the most fundamentally transformative uh, technologies humanity creates, if not the most. And so we just need to make sure, you know, from a humanity perspective, this, this goes well. The initial talk was a nice bird's eye view recap of Neuralink. And the question and answer session was a little bit more specific. Siobhan answered questions that many of you have asked me in the YouTube comments or on Twitter. And one of those questions is, by your estimate, approximately how long do you think it'll be until healthy humans start getting neural implants? And here's what Siobhan had to say. If you were looking for something that, again, just unequivocally is going to going to take you to better control like of your computers and your digital devices and be your default way of interacting, you're, you're probably looking at 12 to 15 years. Um, again, pending FDA cycles and various other things like that. But if you're looking for something I, I have a I have a sneaking hypothesis that some of the, the deeper brain implants will be desired by relatively healthy pe people on a shorter time scale. Um, but again, on the earliest, you're looking at seven to 10 years plus whatever additional regulatory cycle is required to make it just like universally available. But I think the existence proof will exist in seven to 10 years. Although she has good insight into what progress the team is making, keep in mind it's extremely difficult to predict these milestones. She also goes on to add that this timetable will change based on FDA trials. That being said, 12 to 15 years puts us in the years 2033 to 2036. How old will you be at that time? The next question of the session is, what protective measures are being put in place to avoid hacking this biomedical device? Of an IoT device, this is the one that, like, if you hack it, it's closest to home. There, there are definitely a whole bunch of things on on the uh, the firmware software side that uh, we're doing to ensure it doesn't get hacked. The, the reality of the situation is our attack surface doesn't open for at least another few years. Um, and so it's just one of those problems that's going to be very, very important. But it's kind of like, again, like putting the cart before the horse. Like, we need a useful device that's going to go to humans. Um, kind of it's it's just a problem that we will put an extreme amount of energy in starting six to 12 months um, but we have a minimum viable solution now that again we've we've pre-cleared with uh you know how other medical device companies have dealt with similar types of implants um but again like if there are millions of people that millions of people that now have neural links uh you just need to enter this thing as like ironclad but it's just it's just been too early to expend extreme resources on it since it's just it's like it's not in a person yet there's never going to be a hundred percent guarantee of the device not being hacked however i want to reiterate that many members of the Neuralink team have personal motivation to make these devices as safe and effective as possible because they themselves have loved ones or no close friends who have been affected by life-altering diseases they know how impactful the technology they're developing can be, and therefore, it makes sense that they'd work as hard as they possibly can to ensure that the implants are very safe and very secure. As always, if you're interested in listening to the entire talk, the link will be in the description. Next, Lex Friedman spoke with the founder of another exciting brain machine interface company called Kernel. The founder's name is Brian Johnson, and I've recently began learning a lot more about Brian and his past experiences. He is fascinating. I admire how he thinks and believe it's inevitable that Colonel will be successful in some way if he's at the helm. 
During the interview, he discussed how he and Elon were in contact with each other, and they had conversations about brain-machine interfaces before Elon started Neuralink. So there's a guy named Elon Musk, and he has a company, one of the many companies called Neuralink, that has uh, that's also excited about the brain. So it'd be interesting to hear your kind of opinions about a very different approach that's invasive, that requires surgery, that implants a data collection device in the brain. How do you think about the difference between kernel and neural link in the approaches of uh, getting that stream of brain data? Yeah, Elon and I spoke about this a lot early on. We, we met up, I had started kernel and he had an interest in brain interfaces as well. And we explored doing something together, him joining Kernel. And it, ultimately it wasn't the right move. And so he started Neuralink and I, I continued building Kernel. But it was interesting because we were both at this very early time where it wasn't certain what if there was a path to pursue, if now was the right time to do something, and then the technological choice of doing that. And so we were both, our starting point was looking at invasive technologies. And I was building te uh, invasive technology at the time. Uh, that's ultimately where he's gone. Uh, a little less than a year after uh, Elon and I were engaged, I shifted Kernel to do non-invasive. After going to the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, Brian founded a company called Braintree. This company was focused on enabling companies to shift towards mobile commerce by processing payments. The company was acquired by Venmo in 2012 and was eventually bought by PayPal for $800 million. Getting to this point, however, was not easy. Brian had a wide variety of life experiences and struggles that led him to that point. Here's a clip of him discussing some of the challenges he faced. So over the next 14 years, uh, fortunately, that happened when I sold Braintree, but not without going through a a level of hell that was that was indescri that is indescribable. I, I came, became chronically depressed for ten years, and just literally wanted to cease to exist. It was an absolute unbearable existence. And on the hills of that, uh, I sold Braintree. I ended a thirteen-year marriage. Uh, had to rearticulate my, myself as identity with three children. I um, left my church, my, my uh, that I was born into, and reconstruct myself from scratch and basically answer questions like, why do I exist? Is there anything out there? What's this whole thing about? After growing through these struggles and re-architecting himself from scratch, Brian decided to start focusing in on helping humanity thrive. His conclusion was to start Kernel. If you haven't checked out our company spotlight video on Kernel, make sure to check it out using the link here. Next, there's a newly released exclusive question and answer article from IEEE Spectrum. The interviewer asked Neuralink team lead Dr. O'Doherty a series of questions. The first of interest is about the trade-offs between the size and robustness of the electrode threads being inserted in the brain tissue. O'Doherty says there are other flexible and very cool neural interfaces out in the world that we read about in academic publications, but those demonstrations often only have to work for the one hour or one day that the experiment is done, whereas we need to have this working for many, 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 many days. It's a totally different solution space, unquote. One thing I take away from his response is that the team's constantly paying attention to the work being done in research labs around the world. The brain machine interface space is still so young, and therefore any new breakthroughs are likely to be shared more openly than in most other industries. Also, the material science challenge of dealing with trade-offs of placing thinner threads versus thicker threads is one of the most critical components of Neuralink making more progress. Because Neuralink is aspiring to have implanted threads that stay in the brain for decades, they will need to use many different techniques to manufacture, shape, and coat the electrodes. They'll have to make sure that the threads don't move around too much over time, and that the signal quality being recorded doesn't diminish too much over time. The article ended with this question. Is there anything else you want to emphasize about the technology, the work you're doing, or how you're doing it? Dr. O'Doherty says, quote, I first started working on BMI in an academic environment. The concerns that we have at Neuralink are different from the concerns involved with making a BMI for an academic demonstration. We're really interested in the product 
the experience of the user, the robustness, and having this device be useful across a long period of time. And those priorities necessarily lead to slightly different optimizations than I think we would choose if we were doing this for a one-off demonstration. We really enjoyed the Pung demo, but we're not here to make Pung demos. That's just a teaser for what will be possible when we bring our product to market." Unquote. A future with Neuralink, or any high bandwidth, closed loop brain machine interface, is super inspiring. It'll be cool to look back 5, 10, 20 years from now and see the cool applications that have been unlocked. Next, if you watched the June update, you may remember we shared some highlights from a session held by Everything ALS. Their team is trying to detect ALS symptoms by just listening to and watching people speak. They've asked me to help spread the word about their need for people who are willing to participate in this very important research study. One out of every six people are predicted to have a neurological disease by 2030, so it's critical to find early diagnosis and treatments for brain diseases. Participation requires around 5-10 to 10 minutes per week, ideally for 12 months. Anyone can participate, even if you don't have ALS. Join me in this study, and please consider helping support this cause by going to everythingals.org research, or commenting your interests below the video. Lastly, I'll include my favorite clip from the talk given by Siobhan. One thing I think I didn't probably explain clearly enough is there, there are a lot of folks within the neuroscience community and research that are, are targeting very specific things. One of the things that we've been focused on is just there's literally a chicken and egg problem, right? Where like there is no fundamental brain platform that exists. And so both our understanding and our ability to treat are just are just hamstrung right now because humanity just does not get how the brain works on mass. Um, and so for us, a, a lot of people will be like, hey, you know, do, you should, should we partner up on things? Should we do this? And we're like, guys, we can't wait. Like as soon as we have this like stable brain, brain platform that we can, you know, allow others to use or use ourselves for fundamental understanding of the brain, like that'll be sweet. We're like focused on the engineering and the biology of it right now. Um, and again, we are learning things about the brain, but it's just like, it's so early days compared to what things will look like in five to 10 years. So understanding the underpinnings of like what fundamentally governs more complex emotions, like we're just not there yet. Like, I don't, <laughs> we're like a little bit there is humanity by virtue of some F fMRI and related experiments. But like, it's honestly, it's been very humbling because the brain is the thing I think humanity understands least out of like, I think for example, like the AI we've created is way, way, way in excess of how much we understand how much our own brains work, right? It's just, it's just super early. Thanks for listening. Since you've made it this far, we greatly appreciate you supporting by liking, subscribing, and following us on all the major social platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And if you really enjoy our videos, please also consider supporting by clicking the join button or going to patreon.com slash neuropod. Thanks again, and hope you join us again for the next episode. And last, just a reminder, Neuropod receives no compensation from Neuralink and is not formally affiliated with Neuralink in any way. <laughs>